Thank you for joining us today. This is Peninsula 24. Along with the rising nuclear and missile threats from North Korea, human rights violations in the North has become one of the critical challenges facing the international community. The crackdown on human rights in North Korea has intensified since Kim Jong-un took power. And international community has continued various efforts to improve the human rights situation in the North, including the adoption of the North Korean Human Rights Resolution by the UN for 12 straight years. Peninsula 24 takes an in-depth analysis on the human rights situation in North Korea and discuss ways to boost global cooperation to better deal with the issue. For today's discussion, we are joined by Dr. Park Kyung Jung from okay. Korea Institute for National Unification. Okay. Dr. Woo Jung Yeop from Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you. And Dr. Yoanna Hosanya from Citizens Alliance for North Korean Human Rights. I'm happy to be here. Dr. Ba, uh, UN Security Council resolution on North Korea human rights was adopted at the UN General Assembly last month. And resolution have been adopted for 12 straight years in the UN. Foreign Ministry of Korea has explained that it will impose even stronger sanctions on the North. Do you think increased nuclear and missile threats from the North have been uh, contributing factors to the adoption of the new resolution with the strengthened sanctions? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, North Korea's threat has drastically increased in 2016. North Korea implemented two uh, nuclear tests and 24 times of various uh, ballistic missiles. So threat perception has uh, significantly increased in 2016 and uh, UN and also South Korea and the United States has sig significantly increased pressure on North Korea. And in, in, in the context of this uh, increased pressure, the uh, human rights problem has been taken, picked up. And uh, the United States has uh, also in 2016 increased uh, sanctions against North Korea uh, with regard to human rights violations. And also South Korea has increased, uh, is uh, taken several measures to put more pressure on North Korea with regard to human rights problems. Dr. Wu, I'd like to touch upon the major contents of the resolution. The newly adopted UN Security Council resolution has mentioned that human rights violations have been committed by the entity controlled by the North Korean leadership. It has used the word leadership for the first time. And does this mean that it has directly targeted Kim Jong-un as a person who is fully responsible for the human rights problem in North Korea? Yes, we can think so because new resolution for the North Korean human rights accused of a North Korean government institution, which which are controlled by the North Korean leadership. And North Korean leadership is not separable from the Kim Jong-un. All the government apparatus has been controlled by the only one leader in North Korea. So we can, we can definitely know that the leadership means Kim Jong-un. But the reason why they use the term leadership is I think it's the outcome of a political and diplomatic negotiation among the member states because by, the using, by using the term uh, leadership, there's a room for another interpretations. So even though we know that the leadership indicates Kim Jong-un in this case, but they diplomatically left a room for the another interpretation, such as the leadership means like prison warden or some other government officials. So it's just the outcome of political and diplomatic negotiations, but they intended to meet, they intend to mean that the leadership means Kim Jong-un in this case. Okay. Then Dr. Wu, some people have had a skeptical views on strong expression used in the UN Security Council resolution, as it might be difficult to gain support from the neutral countries. Is this the reason why the resolution uh, didn't directly use the name Kim Jong-un 
uh, but used the term leadership instead. Yes, uh, as I just mentioned, that it's the outcome of political and diplomatic negotiation. Because when you use the name of a certain people, then this might be the basis for the another course, such as referral to the ICC. Then Kim Jong Un might be the person who can be indicted in ICC. So that kind of uh, referral is not accepted by uh, China and Russia. So I think they just use this vague term leadership instead of using the name Kim Jong Un in this case. Even though I think they intended to mean the Kim Jong Un in this case when they use the term leadership. So this is just a political and diplomatic negotiation even if we are not satisfied with using this term but I think it's the reality in the in making UN resolution in this case. Okay. Dr. Hosanna, do you have any other opinions on this question? Well, I would like to first clarify um, two differences, maybe also for the viewers, because I think there might be certain confusion regarding the resolutions at the UN. Uh, the Security Council resolutions are stricter nuclear resolutions, and they don't touch normally on any human rights violations. So these are resolutions that are specifying certain sanctions against individuals or companies in the, access, in the annex of these resolutions re regarding building the nuclear arsenal and any uh, military capabilities of uh, um, North Korea and also um, you know, threatening to peace. Um, the threat to peace that, that is on the Korean Peninsula and in the world that North Korea can pursue. The General Assembly resolutions are the stricter human rights resolutions. They do not con they do not um, include any sanctions, in fact. So because only Security Council re resolutions have teeth and only Security Council resolutions can um, impose certain sanctions on the country, the, the General Assembly resolutions do not specify any sanctions. They do not talk about the leadership as well. They only say about the uh, referral, for example, of human rights situation. Uh, to potentially to the International Criminal Court. Um, however, um, it has been only recently that the some somewhat cross-fertilization of these resolutions took place, meaning that certain aspects of uh, resolutions of the Security Council uh, were reflected in the uh, resolution on human rights at the General Assembly. And these are stricter provisions that um, refer to building nuclear resources at the very high costs, uh, which uh, also diverts resources from the population, which is in, you know, in also leading to violations of human rights. Um, so I think we have to be clear um, that you know, General Assembly resolutions do not um, impose certain sanctions and do not talk about the leadership. And this is the reason why um, the international community has to only build a case against certain individuals and their criminal responsibility in order to, f in the future, to specify certain names. Okay. Uh, one more question to you, Dr. Hosanya. Sure. The new resolution has first raised the issue of North Koreans' abuse of overseas workers. Why do you think the international community has paid attention to the issue of North Korean uh, overseas laborers? Um, well, you know, I have worked for the human rights resolutions at the, in Geneva at the Human Rights Council and General Assembly for, uh, since the beginning, and these resolutions always reflect the situation that is changing on the ground and the new information that is coming in. So if you look at the first resolution in 2003, 2004, they were very short resolutions and very limited ones. Uh, and then we were building upon our knowledge and, and also civil society provided very important input 
input into these resolutions of what else has to be included. And because the issue of, of the workers, uh, the, the, the laborers sent abroad to different countries has uh, gained certain momentum because certain organizations provided, um, you know, issued reports and made uh, international campaigns about the situation of these workers abroad. This is why international community decided to reflect the situation of these workers also abroad. However, these resolutions on human rights, they did concern um, the issue of uh, workers in the country. Uh, the, for example, forced labor in detention centers, forced labor of children, uh, um, and general use of forced labor in the country. And this, this resolution directly touches upon additional aspect of forced labor, which is the issue of overseas workers. So if, if I may, there are two aspects of North Korean labors in overseas. First, these uh, North Korean overseas labors are directly fine, even though we, we couldn't find the linkage be, within the North Korea, but there's a strong suspicion that the money financing from the North Korean overseas labor is financing the North Korea's nuclear and all the WMD programs. That's one aspect. And while providing the fund for the North Korean nuclear and WMD programs, these North Korean people who worked overseas are working in very dire conditions, which, which didn't meet any international labor standard. So these North Korean labor's overseas cases have two aspects. One is they are financing that North Korea's illegal activities with regard to the nuclear and the WMD programs. At the same time, they violate human rights and uh, standard labor uh, regulations. Okay. Dr. Bar, uh, North Korea, by publishing an official statement, has uh, strongly condemned the adoption of the new UN Security Council resolution, which has been continuously adopted at the UN General Assembly for 12 years. The first of all, the resolution has nothing to do with the promotion and the protection of the genuine human right, as it is the product of the plot and the conspiracy proceeding from political purpose of the United States. How effective do you think the new resolution will be when it comes to imposing stronger pressure on North Korean leader Kim Jong-un? Uh, I suppose uh, directly and immediately uh, uh, Kim Jong-un would not feel strong uh, pressure, but uh, in the mid, -term, mid and longer term, uh, because uh, North Korean security is basically internal security. Uh, no country around, uh, around North Korea, South Korea, uh, United States, where even China and uh, Japan would not attack uh, North Korea militarily. So the North Korean regime security is basically internal security. So uh, if uh, the uh, human rights problem would be raised again and again, and more people inside North Korea would know more about the, human, the seriousness of human rights uh, violations, and, uh, and that uh, human rights violations would be a crime against humanity, then the raising human rights violations in North Korea would be serious threat to North Korea's regime security. And North Korea must uh, 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 some preparation how to deal with these problems. And also I think that for Kim Jong-un personally, it is very serious threat. I would say that it would be an immediate threat to Kim Jong-un's authority internationally and internally. And Kim Jong-un is a semi-god in North Korea, and Kim Jong-un cannot commit a crime, and even humanitarian crime. So if more people would know that Kim Jong-un is designated as a perpetrator of dire human rights violations internationally, then it would be a serious threat to regime security in North Korea. As we discussed, uh, UN security resolution on North Korea, uh, human rights have been continuously adopted at the UN uh, General Assembly for the last 12 years. Does it mean that the human rights issues in North Korea is still facing a lot of remaining challenges? De definitely, there has been no progress or 
no progress at all in terms of North Korean human rights situation. And all the international community has known it very well, and especially those who work directly for the North Korean human rights, such as Dr. Hosanya, has been working on these issues for more than like 10 years, 15 years. But we didn't have any clue or any evidences that North Korea has worked on improving its human rights violations. But the only thing that I know is that they try to cover up these issues. But that means that they know that they are violating the human rights issues. One episode that I can share with you guys is that I was invited to a talk by the Judge Kirby, who lead the Commission on Inquiry Report in New York. And there was many other uh, US experts uh, were invited in the case. So Judge Kirby mentioned about the importance of the report. At the same time, another US expert say that very next to uh, Judge Kirby. And he said that North Korea has improved human rights. They reduced the number of prison camp and they improved the handicapped person's human rights. So even within the United States, there are some people who mention like that. So I think we, even though there are continuous resolution adopted by the UN for past 12 years, there are still so many things has to be done in the international community, especially Korea and the US to inform the public about these issues. Okay. How do you think? What's your take on this, these questions? Well, I, uh, first of all, I would agree that um, there is an unfinished homework, and this is what has happened with, two years ago with issue of the United Nations Commission of Inquiries report. And this is the biggest challenge for the international community to address all the uh, issues uh, specified in this report. Uh, before this report was really prepared, the international community somehow did not uh, understand the severity of the human rights violations despite these resolutions, despite ongoing reporting by the special rapporteur on DPRK. Uh, and this report stricter says that uh, DPRK has no parallel in the modern world. Uh, that means that the international community has very um, big challenge to address issues that are crimes against humanity or possible even crimes of genocide in the future if, if discovered uh, and maybe in the future also war crimes to address uh, on the Korean Peninsula and this is something that has been ongoing for decades so this is something that cannot be finished with one report or with ten, even 10 years of resolutions. This is something that we have to look into the future next 10 or even 20 years however long it takes uh, it, we have to address both the situation inside the country and somehow force the regime to change the situation or improve the situation inside, but also look into the responsibility of that same leadership for the crimes that were conducted during their own rules. I see. Let's now discuss more about the gravity of the North Korean human rights violations. Human rights violations in North Korea has uh, started to attract a lot of uh, attention in the global society uh, since this wide-ranging and ongoing crime against humanity was first recognized by the UN uh, through the UN Commission of Inquiry Report back in 2014. In comparison to this situation back in 2014, what kind of changes have taken place? And has there been any progress? Uh, I suppose basically uh, human rights violations in North Korea is a systemic and structural problem. So uh, if there is no system change, or the, the, if there is no uh, structural change, and North Korea's human rights violations uh, cannot improve drastically. So we can say basically the level of human rights violation remain the same. But we can also say that the regime uh, changes a policy against uh, towards society. There is a tightening period, there, is, uh, there was a softening pre period. 
I suppose that from 2016, North Korean uh, policy has entered into a tightening period. Uh, in 2016, North, Korea, North Korean regime has initiated a 70-day production battle and also 200-day uh, 200, uh, production battle. And this mobilization period, uh, regime's control over the society, regime's control over the individual uh, has been al always strengthened in order to mobilize all the people uh, to some prestigious uh, product. You must uh, force the people to uh, come to the uh, job places and you must uh, prohibit the person to go to the uh, Jangmadang places. And also the, uh, the people are forced to pay more uh, materials, uh, uh, pay more money to prestigious pro uh, project, uh, construction projects in Pyongyang. So overall, in the uh, mobilization process, the regime's, regime's grip on the society uh, has strengthened. In that sense, uh, uh, from 2016, North Korea, the potential for human rights violations has increased in North Korea. And also we hear that in 2016, uh, there were about 60 public executions in comparison to about uh, 30 in 2012, 13, 14, 15. There were 30, 30 public executions, but in 2016, we hear uh, that there were about 60 public executions. Okay. Dr. Wu, according to a global human rights organization, in, uh, Amnesty International, Kim Jong-un regime has reinforced its abusive rule by increasing the number of illegal prison camp facilities. What do you think is the most urgent uh, human rights issue in Pyongyang? I'm really not sure whether there's any legal prison camp in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So all those things that are done <clears throat> against North Korean people actually violating all the human rights uh, uh, standards. But if we have to pick uh, one uh, evidence that North Korea systematically government and North Korean government violates human rights is the, uh, those illegal prison camps. Those person who are detained in the prison camp, they faced like deliberate starvations, and forced labor, torture, rape, and also they are even denied the reproductive rights, which are unimaginable in any civilized society. And there was a report that about 80,000 to like 12, uh, 112, <clears throat> 20,000 people are detained in those facilities. And the problem also was that they, did, they are detained in those prison camps without any due legal processes. I think Dr. Hosanya can add uh, more. Would you like this. to share uh, your ideas on these questions? Yes, the e issue of, of um, concentration camps, because the, the fact that they are concentration camps, they are death camps. They are not um, only labor or, or political prison camps. They are leading to elimination of the society are one of the biggest issue in North Korean, among North Korean human rights violations. And they've been going for a very long time because it has started uh, with the Korean War, with certain um, ad hoc camps that were built for uh, prisoners of war and, and later developed into full system of political persecution. Uh, however, the changes in the camps have been taken places for many years. And sometimes we see the reports by different organizations saying that there were changes, some camps were closed, some uh, maybe some prisoners were released. We, um, if we don't have enough information, we cannot claim for sure that this is the process. However, what we know for sure is that these camps are usually built around areas where prisoners can work on certain, for example, farms, on uh, where there is a good land, where there is enough uh, resources, um, natural resources, for example, coal r near mining areas, where prisoners can be used for this kind of work. And if that changes, 
with time. And if you think about exploitation of natural resources of, or the land, it of course will be depleted with time. These prison camps usually are relocated. And this issue has been ongoing for many years, so for decades really. So uh, we don't really know whether uh, um, you know, the, the changes in the system of the camps is related, for example, to the depletion of resources and removing some of the force into other and joining other political prison camps, or whether this is, for example, you know, an attempt to reform the political prison camp system. N nobody really believes in that, but uh, I would rather say that these changes are uh, reflecting the situation on the ground. Uh, it's nothing unusual that is going on and nothing that has really changed over uh, 40, 50 years. Okay. One more question to you, Dr. Hosanya. Sure. Aside from uh, the human rights abuses within the North Korean society, human rights of overseas North Korean laborers have been seriously violated as well. How is the current situation that the North Korean laborers uh, overseas face regarding uh, human rights abuses? Uh, I think maybe Dr. Wu can uh, expand on that, but um, um, this um, workers are generally a, a, a tool for the North Korean regime to uh, earn currency. So the biggest problem is that the, they do not receive their salaries on hands or um, you know into private accounts. Ma majority of cases they do not even hold bank accounts, individual bank accounts in those countries. That means that uh, majority of these resources. 90% that we know from different interviews are taken by the regime. Only small, uh, a small portion is given to people f to for their, you know, uh, maintenance. So, for example, buying of food. Also, out of that fund, they have to uh, provide certain um, donations. For example, for cultural kind of donations uh, to the uh, regime, to the leader, and so on. Thus, the regime takes a lot of these finances from, from people and what they have on hand is very little to have a healthy sustenance while you know, working long hours in those countries. And to, they also can try to save as much money as possible because even if this is a very small amount, for them it's a very substantial amount when they come back to their country. So that's why they rather prefer to uh, save on, on the uh, food and, you know, even if they have some health issues, they are unattended uh, j in order to save that money. So I, I think this is one of the reasons, but also the fact that they have no access, really um, free access to medical services, to NGOs that could monitor, to governmental institutions that are in the country, like for example, labor inspections that can uh, um, um, monitor the situation of these workers. Uh, and they have n no right to, for example, you know, uh, to know how much they are supposed to earn, no right to have uh, vacations, to go back to their country and, you know, meet with their family. Their family, in fact, is kept hostage in other countries. However, one aspect I would like to raise is there is a certain difference of the workers that are in, for example, European Union countries and workers that are in other countries like African countries or certain uh, countries in the Middle East, uh, Russia as well. And this is uh, one of the very conflicting issue of what we should do really with these workers. I am personally of the opinion that in terms of workers in European Union, we should use our high uh, labor and human rights standards to impose very strong conditions on receiving these workers and have free access to these workers, including informing them how much they earn and enforcing that they receive their money on their hands. Because in majority of interviews, they always say that they d never knew how much they earned and they thought that these were the local businesses that were stealing from them. So I think this this one of the things that we would change would um, somehow uh, buy us in a way uh, understanding of these workers because they do not know what human rights means and we have to somehow educate them and educate them and prepare them when they come back to these countries. If North Korea if we prohibit this 
work, workers to be in, in Europe, I think uh, in, this is unrealistic to ex expect that North Korea will stop sending them somewhere else. And unfortunately, they will send them to uh, countries where we have no leverage, diplomatic leverage, or no access, no monitoring in many of these African countries. However, I talked to many African diplomats and they already said that the numbers is increasing in their countries and they worked under horrific conditions there, much worse. And I think this is one of the negative outcome that may be a result of this campaign, that uh, we should channel these workers if they have to be, because they will be sent anyway. North Korea needs this money, they will not stop sending them. To the countries where we have leverage of improving their conditions, instead of you know, prohibiting that at all and hoping that the, in, in, the situation will improve on its own. It will not, and North Korea will use it just to, you know, for the, uh, um, trade and negotiations with other countries. I don't know if Dr. Yeah. Wu would like to add it, something. It is, it is true that <clears throat> those countries who respond to the international community's request to uh, enhance the, the labor standards of North Korean overseas workers are those European countries. And they, uh, they promptly respond to the, the US request and international community request. So such as like Poland, they, they denied to extend the visa of those workers in uh, shipbuilding industries in Poland. But as Dr. Hoxhan just mentioned that compared to other countries which has even lower standards of labors domestically, North Korean workers in those countries faced even worse uh, conditions. So we have some we have we, we need to consider what kind of policy options we should choose to channel the information through those overseas workers because they might be the only channels that we can, uh, we can have to inform the North Korean workers about these human rights violations uh, operated by its own country. Okay. Uh, Dr. Park, Pyongyang has shown sensitive responses whenever uh, its human rights violations have become under the spotlight by saying that it contains uh, distorted information. Why do you think the North has especially show, uh, shown such a uh, sensitive response against the human rights issues in North Korea? Yes, North Korea uh, usually uh, reacts uh, st very strongly whenever, uh, whenever what, is, what it is said uh, uh, contradictory about its official facade. And uh, the human rights case is the, we can say, the most important uh, case, uh, example of such a strong, uh, strong uh, uh, negative uh, reaction. Because uh, I, su I suppose uh, the human rights violation, the name of human rights, naming, of, naming and shaming of human rights violation would touch the weakest point of North Korean regime. Uh, the North Korean security, North Korean regime security is not threatened by outside powers. Not, uh, not by military forces, but by internal contradictions, internal tensions. And uh, human right, the naming, of, naming and shaming of human rights violation directly touches North Korea's the weakest point, uh, the tension between regime and the society, and the regime and the individual. And this is one, uh, uh, one reason. And the second reason is that naming and shaming of human rights uh, violation uh, implicates uh, Kim Jong Un's uh, responsibility. Whenever there is, we, when, whenever the international society talks about North Korea's human rights violation, Kim Jong Un is implicated. The uh, the Suryong, the the godlike leader in North Korea, is implicated, and and this uh, the reduction of uh, Kim Jong Un's authority in the international society and also in the internal society would. Pose, pose danger to regime, society, regime security in North Korea. Okay. Dr. Wu, global society has put a lot of uh, efforts from various angles in order to deal with the uh, North Korean human rights abuses. The UN Security Council Resolution 2321, uh, which was adopted about 80 days after the North's fifth nuclear test, 
included an article which addresses the grave human rights situation in North Korea. What does the newly implemented article mainly cover? Yeah, as Dr. Ho San Yang mentioned, that we have to separate two different resolutions by the United Nations. And the one that we just mentioned is the adopted by November 30th by the United Security Council, United Nations Security Council, which was about the North Korea's nuclear and the WMD programs. And it mentioned that North Korea, uh, they condemned North Korea because they pursued the nuclear and the ballistic missile program at the expense of uh, its own people. So even though the, this resolution 2321 is not about North Korean human rights, but it recognized that North Korean WMD program is being established at the expense of North Korean people's welfare. Okay. Concerns have arisen over the effect of the newly adopted UN Security Council Resolution 2321 as the strength of the resolution might not be strong as we expected. However, the resolution has officially mentioned the human rights violations for the first time. What kind of significance does it carry? Yeah, uh, the UN, Res UN Security Council Resolution 2321 is directed against North Korea's uh, provocation, the fifth nuclear test. Uh, when a uh, human rights problem is uh, written in this, uh, in this uh, resolution, it means that the development of uh, weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, is closely linked with the human rights violation in North Korea. And uh, Dr. Hosanyak has uh, very well explained what uh, the connection has been. And I suppose uh, the inclusion of human rights violation in UNSC resolution means that we, can, we must solve the two problems simultaneously. One cannot solve one problem without solving the other problem. So uh, from this time on, we, whenever we talk about uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons development, we must think about the suffering of people uh, in North Korea and uh, the increased uh, deterioration of human rights situation in North Korea. Uh, in order to end uh, the North Korean human rights violations, it might be inevitable to bring Kim Jong-un to the trial at the International Criminal Court, the ICC. UN resolution on North Korean human rights also calls for the referral of the North's human rights situation to the ICC for the third consecutive year. How do you see the possibility of the North Korean human rights violation to be brought before the ICC? I suppose the, possibili the possibility is not uh, strong, but uh, we must continue to mention this, in this problem. And why the, uh, the, the reason why the possibility is uh, low is that uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, the problem to be referred to ICC, uh, the problem must be firstly condoned by UN uh, Security Council. And uh, UN, in the UN Security Council, there are uh, Russia and China, uh, who these countries are uh, vehemently against referral of North Korean human rights problem to ICC. But, uh, uh, but we don't have to uh, stop, uh, mention this problem. We must continue to mention this problem. And we suppose that uh, whenever we talk about this problem, the pressure against uh, China and Russia would increase, uh, even if uh, gradually and not much. And in the end, we have, we have uh, opportunity to make our uh, dream real. Okay. Dr. Wu, in July, the U.S. added North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and other North Korean government officials on the, UN, uh, the U.S. sanction list for human rights abuses. Putting a leader of a third country on the list of the uh, sanctions individuals on charge of human rights violation was quite an unprecedented and strongest ever measure taken by the U.S. What kind of negative impact uh, has it had on uh, North Korea? It is uh, true that 
this naming the North Korean leader as a human rights violation uh, means a lot to the international community for the human rights. But the problem is that how much damage it can really uh, impose on North Korean leader is, we, we, is what we have to see. Because these sanctions has been, uh, the sanctions for the nuclear and the WMD program has been there for a long time, but we see a very little uh, progress, even if we try to put various uh, ways of the pressures on North Korean regime to stop their nuclear and WMD programs, but the progress has been uh, very little. And it might be the same in North Korean human rights issues. Uh, unless North Korean leader fears that its regime is uh, on the verge of a collapse because of the sanctions imposed by the international community, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un would never do anything to improve its human rights, uh, its people's human rights, because he, he would knows that improved human rights in North Korea will eventually uh, criticize his regime and cripple his regime in the long run. That is why he doesn't care about the, the, his people's uh, human rights cases. So we, we have to try all the various, all various ways to gap the holes in North Korean sanctions. So I think it's an important step to fill these gaps. Uh, whether it's a North Korean nuclear or WMD program or it's a human rights, but we don't expect this sanction should have immediate uh, influence on North Korean regime. So this is a very long, uh, this should be a very long, uh, very stiff appeal battle in the long run. Okay. Uh, Dr. Park, uh, do you think the Trump administration will also understand the seriousness and gravity of the North Korean human rights issues? Uh, during the uh, presidential campaign, uh, uh, Mr. Trump has not uh, much, uh, much talked about uh, North Korea and on also not uh, much talked about uh, human rights violations in North Korea. But I suppose uh, because of the seri seriousness of uh, security threat uh, from North Korea, the development of uh, intercontinental nuclear ballistic missile, the, the possibility in three or four years. Uh, that uh, makes uh, Trump uh, very uh, special. Uh, that makes uh, Trump pay special attention to North Korea. And there are not uh, much good instruments to influence North Korea. And I, I, I think that with other pressure uh, in instruments, uh, human rights problem uh, also uh, also remain as a very important uh, tool of the American North Korea policy. Okay. So may, maybe, maybe in the past, uh, it was say that the U.S. Republican government has paid less attention to the human rights issues than the Democratic government in the United States. But uh, we have to know that it was uh, under President George W. Bush when the North Korean defector issues uh, were brought up to the White House. And so no matter what the government in the United States that we will uh, see, but it's important thing is that how we push these issues to the U.S. government. So no matter what the Trump government would say about North Korean human rights issues and how much attention they are going to pay eventually uh, in terms of U.S. government, but no matter what, we, we have to push these issues to the U.S. government to uh, direct a certain policy outcomes in this field. Okay. The new round of sanctions imposed by Korea and the U.S. have included measures against individuals and entities, including Air Korea, which have involved in transporting North Korean workers. The major goal of such extended sanctions is to further block the North's inflows of funds. But uh, it might also impose a significant impact on human rights issues on North Korean workers abroad. Uh, what is your take on this? Well, we have to see, first of all, these uh, sanctions, they are developed um, um, 
and we have to see what kind of impact it will have in the future really and how North Korea uh, will direct the for example certain workers do not have to use air Korea the workers that for example enter China they can enter there by train and by other uh, transportation officially and then from there go to Russia and other countries so I think there is a lot of room for North Korean authorities to uh, avoid the sanctions and there are also other countries that would make sure to help North Korea to uh, avoid the sanctions. Uh, one issue though that we have to kind of uh, raise here is that the sanctions in majority as Dr. Wu mentioned are targeting individuals or companies that are directly um, it contributing to the development of nuclear weapons. So these are certain technologies, uh, transportation, uh, training, and, uh, and transfer of, of materials and so on. They do not target, uh, for example, food or medicine. So uh, they exclude actually that. Uh, and um, however, in terms of uh, using sanctions uh, for human rights purposes, this has never been explored yet. And there is this issue that is ongoing of listing certain individuals, in the, including Kim Jong-un, uh, but also individuals um, in certain institutions that are directly oppressing and involved in uh, mass human rights violations in the country, uh, and listing them. Uh, and that could be also used for certain, not sanctions for the country, but uh, individual sanctions, for example, travel bans, which also some of these resolutions on nuclear uh, issues address, travel bans of certain individuals that can be both linked to the nuclear development, but also the involvement in the certain institutions that violate human rights, other, other personnel, people that escaped to other countries that were perpetrators. This could be also used for uh, so-called um, universal jurisdiction, which many countries could use in the future to actually try certain people that are traveling in certain countries and were well documented that they have violated their rights. There is uh, a lot of room uh, of uh, targeting sanctions not against the country but really against the individuals and I think that might be more effective than targeting sanctions against countries. Mm, okay. Dr. Bach, Seoul's North Korean Human Rights Act finally come, came into effect. After uh, 11 years, it was first brought before the National Assembly. The Unification Ministry of North Korean Human Rights Archive started a pilot uh, project to investigate and collect data on North Korea's human rights abuses. Do you think such kind of effect can be a strong pressure on North Koreans uh, who are responsible for uh, human rights violations? I think it, it would be a gradual uh, process, a step-by-step -step process. For now, I think that international campaign against North Korea's human rights violation uh, have made North Korean regime nervous. And for now, only high-ranking people, high-ranking persons know that human rights violation uh, has become a very serious problem in international society. And uh, the, fa the fame of uh, the, uh, the dignity of Kim Jong-un is hang on balance because of human rights violations. So the high-ranking people has reacted uh, very uh, uh, strongly in order to block uh, for the Kim Jong-un's name be named. And, but uh, in the, uh, with the pass of time, more people would know about that human rights violation would, is a serious crime and would be uh, charged, uh, uh, criminally charged. And if they know uh, that human rights, uh, viol uh, any human rights violation is recorded by South Korean uh, institution, they would be, they, the low-ranking persons would, be, would become nervous and they think twice before they uh, do something against uh, human rights viol uh, violation. Okay. Please let me hear your final remarks on these questions. The international community has galvanized efforts to improve the North Korean human rights. How should the Korean government cooperate with the global society to tackle the human rights violation in the North? 
Dr. Wu? I think uh, the, most, the most important element is that we have to see what this issue is really about. As, you, as we just discussed, that it took more than a decade to pass the North Korean Human Rights Act in South Korea. That means that many Koreans just still approach this issue from their ideology and the political orientations. And whenever I met those kind of arguments, I think that this is, is more like a comfort woman issues. It's, a, it's about universal values. It's not about political agenda. It's not about ideological agenda. This is more about basic human rights. And then, so we, we have to have our own positions to convince the observers and the international community that international community has to be aware of this issue and they have to be, have to be on the same pages with us on improving the North Korean human rights. So I think within Korean domestic situation, we have to know that this is not about political issues, but, all, but the basic uh, human uh, universal uh, rights. Okay, Dr. Osanya. First of all, if Korean government uh, talks about reunification plans, we have to think about long term and what it involves. Uh, you cannot reunify with a country where there are grave human rights violations, crimes against humanity ongoing. Uh, it's not about economic issue. This is a real security threat if you reunify with such country coming from military forces, secret service forces that can pose direct threat to South Korea. And I think South Korean government, given the Human Rights Act that has passed recently and trying to build different institutions that may respond to, for example, uh, um, responsibility of certain individuals, uh, institutions, have to look um, seriously into that question, uh, into the question that international community now raises, the issue of responsibility, accountability, and so-called transitional justice when it happens in the future, and has to prepare for that. Look at the examples of the countries that are very similar in certain aspects to North Korea, especially Central Europe, post-communist countries there, how they dealt with the past and what it involved. Uh, Otherwise, this kind of reunification would not work easily for us and would present a lot of uh, security issues and security threats for South Korean uh, society as well. So this is something that South Korean government has to step uh, up and kind of raise its level to the level of where the international community is right now. Okay. Dr. Park, please. Uh, we must sharpen uh, uh, perception of seriousness of human rights violations in North Korea. And we must enhance uh, internal consensus about the seriousness of human rights uh, problem in, in North Korea. Uh, even if we have uh, human rights acts uh, now, uh, the foundation for North Korean human rights has not yet uh, started. Uh, we have uh, some problems and we now have uh, internal political turmoil and I suppose uh, the start of the foundation of North Korean human rights would be postponed because of uh, internal situations. And I suppose uh, South Korea uh, is the, I so South Korea must be the most active actor in the uh, enhancing North Korea's human rights violations, uh, situations because it is our problem and we must enhance our uh, perception and consensus about uh, North Korea's human rights violations. Okay. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing your opinions today.